Okay, this is lecture for chapter 13, Social Psychology. We will be going over in module 13.1, pro-social and antisocial behaviors. So once I complete this lecture, you should be able to uh, understand Kohlberg's approach in Tomorrow Reasoning. We'll talk about the prisoner's dilemma, dilemma task, have an uh, ability to explain logical considerations in terms of why we cooperate. We'll look at bystander apathy as well as social loafing, and then talk about aggression, aggression and uh, those type of behaviors, antisocial behaviors. So let's start with morality. Is it logic or is it from our emotions? Understand that psychologists, they once regarded morality as a set of arbitrary type of rules. Think of it like uh, learning to stop at a red light and then be able to go uh, when it's green. Kohlberg, he proposed instead that moral reasoning is actually a process which matures through a series of different stages. That's kind of like uh, Piaget's stages of cognitive development. According to Colbert, <clears throat> we evaluate people's moral reasoning. We would ask about the reasons for their decisions, not just about the decisions that they made it themselves. Colbert talked about how psychologists' attention should be on the reasoning process behind moral decisions. But people usually wouldn't deliberate about right or wrong before they act. More often than not, what they do is they'll make a quick decision and then they look for reasons afterwards. So additionally, we have to look at the fact that most moral decisions are going to be more emotional rather than logical. Kohlberg's analysis falls kind of short toward the uh, another way. We also got to look at how a lot of people, especially uh, that's not in Western cultures, such as the United States, kind of look at their moral decisions based um, on factors that Kohlberg really ignored altogether. And those factors would be in loyalty, authority, as well as purity. Now, in terms of when we're talking about uh, altruistic behaviors, something that we should always want to try to aspire to. As humans, we sometimes will engage in these pro-social or altruistic type uh, behaviors. And for those who are not sure about altruist, altruistic behaviors, I'm talking about wanting to help others without getting something in return. Altruism is uncommon in animal species. So, just about every species, animals would devote great energy and risk to their own lives to help their babies or their relatives. But rarely would they do as much to help unrelated individuals. If you're not part of the pack, I don't have time for you. One explanation we can think about in terms of altruistic behaviors is that cooperating helps to build a reputation. People will start to look toward for you and look up to you. This reputation, though, requires individuals to be able to recognize other people. There's another explanation that people might cooperate um, will punish those who do not. Now. This type of retaliation, they'll need to recognize who's failed uh, to cooperate with others. All right, so now if we take a look at this uh, slide, we're looking at how we might investigate cooperation and competition. <laughs> how many athletes do I have? I know I have several. And even if you're not an athlete, Many times or not, we tend to want to be the best and we want to outdo another. Think about video games or any type of game that matter. You want to win, right? So <clears throat> in terms of co cooperation and competition, researchers, they have been able to use a study, this particular study, The Prisoner's Dilemma. 
this is that situation where people was chosen <clears throat> uh, between a cooperative act as well as a competitive act that would benefit themselves but might hurt other people. So imagine that you and a partner um, were arrested and charged with armed robbery. Oh my goodness. Police might stop you and, and take y'all to separate rooms and then they're gonna interrogate you, interrogate both of you until one of you confess to the crime. And if neither of you confess, then pretty much police really don't have any evidence. They'll have to let you go. Um, and they won't be able to convict you of the robbery. But they can convict you of a lesser offense if the sentence was, say, for like a year in prison. So if either person confesses and they testify against the other person, the confessor will go free, basically, and the other person is going to get 20 years in prison. And they're going to they're gonna bounce it against the two of you, okay? So, however, if both of you confess to a crime, then you might only wind up with five years in prison. Each person would know that the other person has those same type of options. If your partner doesn't confess and you confess, you'll go free. Let's assume, though, you care about the other person and not about your partner. If your partner confesses, you can still gain by confessing because you'll only get five years in prison instead of that 20. So you confess. Your partner, reasoning with the same way, also confesses. So guess what? They got you for five years in prison. If you both had kept quiet, you would only have served one year. In this type of situation, it's a trap. Both people, you know, they're trapped into this uncooperative type of behaviors. Now, accepting or denying responsibility toward others. When we're talking about accountability and people taking responsibility of what they do, a lot of times it's difficult for people to do that. People are less likely to help someone if there are other people that's in an equally good position to help. They'll be like, oh, well, Sally can help her out. I don't have to do it. Sally's around, Sally can take care of it. Social loafing is that tendency to be able to loaf or don't work as hard as others when sharing work with other people. Think about times you've been at work. Think about when you were working on group presentations. You may have individuals who felt, well, since they're doing the PowerPoint slides themselves, I really don't have to give too much input. People will work hard in groups if they expect other people to notice their efforts or if they think that it can contribute something that other group members can't. So just remember with bystander and helpfulness as well as apathy, we're looking at diffusion of responsibility. And that's talking about how it tends to have less responsibility to act if there's other people equally able to do it. Pluralistic ignorance is a situation where people wouldn't say anything and uh, each person they're going to falsely assume and y'all know the breakdown of assume right i won't do it i won't say it but you understand and might have heard that analogy but when there's false assumptions that others going to have more a more informed or better opinion and again social loafers loafing is when people are going to be they're not going to be working hard they're kind of lazy at it they, they figure well Sally can do it, I don't have to. Let's move on to anger and aggression. What are the causes? So there's a hypothesis and that hypothesis is called the frustration and aggression hypothesis. And according to that particular hypothesis, the main reason for anger and aggression would be frustration. When you get frustrated, you tend to, I'm one of those people like, out of nowhere, I'll just give a grunt because I'm becoming frustrated, which tends to lead to my anger. This is usually due when there's an obstacle that stands in the way of being able to do something or obtaining something. But realize frustration kind of makes you angry 
only when you believe that the other person acted intentionally if it's involving other people. So you might feel angry if someone ran down the hall and they bumped into you. Um, another example of that, living in New York, one of the reasons I told, I might have shared with you that I'm happy that I'm no longer a New Yorker is because the streets of New York was always so full of people and busy. And you could not walk down a block in Manhattan without being bumped by somebody. Uh, and you tend to think that they did it on purpose, but reality is the sidewalk is so crowded, you're going to get bumped into someone. But in terms of when you have that thought that they ran down the hall and bumped into you purposely, it's not that if it was someone that might have, you know, you wouldn't think that same way if someone has slipped on a wet spot and bumped into you. If you saw the reason, then you tend to not be get as angry as if you thought just somebody for no reason at all just bumped into you then it's you know you'll feel that it was done on purpose now there are differences when we talk about aggression okay and there have been studies um that found a small relationship between aggressive behaviors and that with low self-esteem However, others find virtually no relationship between the two at all in doing research. So no evidence indicated that low self-esteem causes aggressiveness. And more likely the situation is whatever life events led to the uh, low self-esteem probably also led to the uh, feelings of aggressiveness. Research on the correlation between mental illness and aggressiveness showed that only mental patients who are de dealing with substance issues will pose an increased danger of committing a violent crime. Mentally ill people without drug abuse or uh, alcohol abuse, they were no more dangerous than anybody else. So there's been many individuals that worry that playing video games, going back to that type of example, would demonstrate an increase of aggressive behavior or decrease of cooperative type behaviors. However, the best designed studies did show little or no effect at all. There's factors that's associated with a tendency toward violent behavior, and it's including growing up in a neighborhood that's been violent, having uh, parents that demonstrated antisocial behaviors, uh, like if you have a mother who smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol during pregnancy, that may be a factor, research has demonstrated. Poor nutrition or exposure to lead or other toxic chemicals uh, early in life may have been a factor. Traumatic brain injuries, those type of, uh, if, if there's a history of that, that might demonstrate and show uh, an individual that may have had uh, aggressive uh, aggressiveness. Not feeling guilty of when you hurt somebody is definitely a factor that we would have to look for. Then there's that of weaker um, sympathetic nervous system responses, and this that's pretty much correlating with not feeling bad after hurting somebody else. You'll see um, factors that have high levels of testosterone that's going to be uh, compared and shared with low levels of cortisol if there's a history of suicide attempts. So these are all differences that um, might explain why someone might become uh, violent. Now, in terms of cognitive influences on violence, people are often going to justify their acts by thinking of themselves as being better than those that they're hurting. Uh, in psychology, <clears throat> there's been psychologists have described the process as de-individuation, and that's meaning that they're perceiving others as anonymous. They're not seeing a person's real personality. And it's also uh, involving dehumanization. And dehumanization is when you're perceiving others as less than human. So 
this can result in greater acceptance in terms of violence and, and injustice. People also would justify their violent behaviors by decreasing their own sense of identity. An example being a soldier on duty no longer is acting as an individual making his or her own decisions. Or if we think in terms of racial conflicts, a Ku Klux Klansman wearing a hood suppresses the sense of personal identity. They're willing to be more violent under the cloak, under that hood. Now, in terms of talking about sexual aggression, rape is a sexual activity without the consent of a person. In one way, about 10% of adult females reported that they had been forcibly raped. And then another 10% said that they had sex while incapacitated by alcohol or other type of substances. However, statistics vary considerably from one study to another. In terms of sexual assaults that's legally qualified as rape, only half of the victims think of the experience as rape itself, and far fewer report it to the police. So most women who have had <clears throat> involuntary sex with a boyfriend or other acquaintance, they won't call the police, <clears throat> they won't even call it a, a, the event of rape, particularly if there was any kind of substances like alcohol involved. Rapists are not going to be all alike. It's not a cookie cutter thing. Many are going to be hostile and distrustful uh, men with a history of other acts of violence and criminality. Sexually aggressive men will tend to be high users of pornography and rapists are much more likely than other men to enjoy violent pornography. Another element though we have to think about in rape is extreme self-centeredness or the lack or concern for others. And I do want to make note as the textbook is discussing rape and it's uh, leaning gender heavy more toward females being the victim, do realize that men have been victims of rape as well. That by other men or even women, okay? Now let's stop and take a look at social perception and cognition, which is module 13.2. In this module, we are going to learn about primacy effect. Uh, we're going to talk about implicit association tests and how we use that with measuring prejudice. We're going to start thinking about different ways we can overcome prejudice, as well as be able to distinguish the three main influences on attributions. We'll look at actor observer effect as well as the fundamental attribution error. And then we're going to talk about cultural dif differences in terms of attributions. So other things being equal, we pay a lot of attention to the first information that we generally would learn about someone than to, to the later information provided. This is what primacy effect is all about. First impressions form rapidly and then some are more accurate than we might even guess. But with first impressions, it's not going to always be accurate. First impressions can become self-fulfilling prophecies, those expectations that increase the probability of the predicted type of event. So suppose a psychologist hands you a cell phone and asks you to talk with someone while showing you a photo supposedly of that person. Unknown to the person you're speaking to, the psychologist might hand you a photo of a very attractive person, or it can be of a less attractive uh, person in the photo. Not surprising, you may act friendlier to the person you regard as attractive. And besides that, if you think you are talking to someone attractive, that person reacts by becoming more cheerful and talkative. So basically, your first impression is changing how you act and influence the other person to liven up, or they might start acting cold based upon your expectations.
when talking about stereotypes and prejudices, first let's talk about stereotypes. Stereotypes are those generalized beliefs about groups of people and prejudice is those unfavorable types of st uh, stereotypes that's been attached. Usually it's associated with discrimination, which is unequal treatment of different groups, such as minority groups. The physically disabled, people who are considered obese, people whose sexual orientation may be of homosexuality, um, being gay or lesbian or transgender. So really to think about it, one thing I want to express and say, especially in terms of prejudice, we all are biased in some form or fashion. We all are. We may be prejudiced not toward particular groups per se, but mannerisms and actions. And it's really important that we understand that so that we can become more aware of those prejudices and ask ourselves why it exists in the first place. Now, the implicit association test helps us to be able to measure prejudice, okay? And more or less, it helps to measure those reactions to a combination of different categories. So the implicit <clears throat> association test reveals prejudices that people don't want to even admit to. Like I said, we all have it, but we tend not to believe we do. We, can, we go into a sense of denial sometimes. However, contrary to what some theorists had assumed, it's kind of wrong to say that the prejudices are unconscious. When people are asked about their prejudice, but urged to answer honestly, their answers usually correlates more strongly with their uh, implicit association test, test results. So also we have to look at the fact that if people are asked to predict their results on, I'll say IET at this point, they usually do so fairly accurately and Basically, people do know their prejudices, even if they'll hesitate to admit to it. Now, how do we overcome prejudice? This is something I like for you to think about. Generally speaking, when we're working together, right now we are in a crisis, we're in a pandemic. We're dealing with COVID-19. And I can say the one thing COVID-19 is a virus or is a bacteria that can affect anyone. And if we work together and share the common goal of keeping ourselves healthy, then perhaps we can move between prejudices just the same manner. Working together for a common goal usually will weaken the prejudice of between groups. So if we're all working together to stay alive, to stay healthy, to keep ourselves in, in practicing safe practices such as the social distancing and being able to do proper hand hygiene, it doesn't matter what your race is. You would not want to necessarily just give all and just say, okay, one group of people is more important than the other. No one is more important when it comes to COVID-19. The same should be able to hold true when we're talking about prejudice. If we start working together, then we can start learning and understanding each other's culturally, our belief systems, our value systems, and understand that even though we're different, we are all living in the same world and we need to learn to work together. All right, so let's think about how we're decreasing prejudice and start to uh, increase the level of acceptance. And there is a difference, let me say this first and foremost, there's a difference between acceptance and tolerance. Many people feel they saying, oh, I accept that I have this friend and that friend that's in this race or that race uh, who's gay or not. But think about this. If your friends are different than you, would you have to put a label to them? 
is it that you tolerate what they are or who they are? Um, when we're trying to say increase acceptance, we want to look how we go about doing that. Most people today will publicly endorse that goal of treating all people fairly without prejudice. But the way of expressing this goal will have a major effect on the result. Consider that expression, we treat all people the same. Now that sounds really good. It's really a good implication, but we expect all people to act the same. What if you're not the same as everyone else? We will differ from others in racial or ethnic backgrounds, our sexual orientation or, 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 or different ideals, they're different. But you might be older or younger than most or only a man or only a woman within an organization and under a particular policy of treating everyone the same, people are supposed to ignore the fact that you're different. And that's not what you really want to do. You don't want to ignore that a person's different. We have to learn acceptance. When people try not to notice skin color, notice one's sexual orientation or anything else, or try to avoid being prejudiced, they find that this, eff this effort becomes unpleasant and it can be draining on your energy. This results often in an increase within prejudice instead of the reverse. An alternative to this is what we call multiculturalism. And multiculturalism is being able to accept, to recognize, as well as enjoy the differences among people and groups and look at the unique contributions a person has to offer. Research shows that there are advantages to multiculturalism approach. When a company or organization endorses a multiculturalist position, members of both the majority as well as people of color feel more comfortable. All right, so now let's talk about attributions. What are attributions? Attributions is that set of thought processes by which we may assign internal or external causes to our behaviors. Okay, when we're speaking about internal versus external causes, we're looking at with internally as those explanations that we might see based on someone's attitude, that being your personality traits, your characteristics, uh, your abilities. External is those things that's outside from you based on situations or events that would might influence the behavior. We would make an internal or external attribution usually based on how one uh, consensus, uh, when we're comparing ourselves to others, consistency, how often do we see a particular behavior being occurred, and distinctiveness, how the behavior is going to be different from one another. Now, <clears throat> the, the actor-observer effect. We're more likely to attribute internal causes to other people's behavior than our own. <laughs> and that's what we call the actor-observer effect. You are an actor when you try to explain the causes of your own behavior and the observer when you try to explain someone else's behavior. People will generally uh, attribute people's behavior to internal causes, even when they see evidence of external influences. This tendency is known as the fundamental attribution error. We also um, know this as being correspondence bias, meaning it's a tendency to assume strong similarities between someone's current actions and his or her dispositions. In terms of the fundamental attribution era, it varies by culture. People within Western um, cultures, they tend to make more internal personality type attributions, whereas people on Eastern um, territories, regions, uh, like Asian countries, they'll tend to make it more external attributions. It's gonna be more situational. So as a result, Asian, uh, 
communities or Asian populations expect more change and less consistency in people's behavior from one situation to another. They're less um, guided by the first impressions that we as Americans would have. And they're also going to be more likely to accept those contradictions and look for compromises rather than viewing one position as correct and sticking to it saying, okay, this is the only way, this is the right way or the highway. People often are going to try to protect their uh, self-esteem by attributing their excesses to those skills and their failures to the outside influences. So think of it like this. You might credit your good grades to your intelligence and hard work, which would be an internal attribution. But you'll blame your worst grades on unfair tests because I gave a hundred question t examination, which would be that external attribution. People will sometimes place themselves at a disadvantage though to provide an excuse for the failure. So suppose you're afraid that you'll do poorly on an exam. You'll stay out late and party hard the night before. You won't pick up that book and open it at all. But now, because you party hard, you can blame your low score for it on a lack of sleep without admitting that you might have done <clears throat> you might have done poorly anyway because you didn't open the book. Get it? All right. So now we're going to speak about attitudes and persuasion. So in this module, we're looking at attitudes and persuasion. Once we're finished with this particular module, we should be able to explain how attitudes are measured. We'll be looking at cognitive dissonance and be able to look at some of the experiments um, and ways we've studied cognitive dissonance. We'll talk about peripheral and central routes to persuasion, as well as different techniques of persuasion. We'll also look at the effectiveness or ineffectiveness about fear messages and be able to talk and just explain about coercive persuasion and how it messes up information. All right, so attitudes and behavior. An attitude, a dislike or a like or dislike that would influence one behavior. So an attitude uh, that influences behavior. Hmm. Your attitude will include an evaluative or an emotional component to it, pretty much how you might feel about something. And then there's a cognitive component about what you might know or believe in that particular attitude. The behavioral component is what you're likely to do in terms of that attitude. People have reported attitudes do not always match their behaviors. There are so there's a lot of folks who would say one thing and then actually do something else all in regard, particularly when we're talking about alcohol, when we're talking about safe sex, if we're talking about conserving natural resources or being green resources, not resources, <laughs> or our um, level of study techniques, how we how we're studying. Think about your attitudes and know that your attitudes are more likely to match your behavior if you have personal experiences with the topic that's at hand. When we talk about cognitive dissonance, this is that state of unpleasant tension that's going to come up from a behavior that might conflict with an attitude. So people may try to reduce the inconsistency they have and often by changing their attitudes um, in terms of that conflict. When we're making a decision, it may seem unimportant or when you have many more serious concerns that can't be devoted uh, much effort to the decision, you form or change an attitude. And that's going to be by the peripheral route to persuasion. That is, it's based mostly on, it's going to be based mostly on your emotions. So if you feel any reason to associate something with feeling happy, or you may form a favorable attitude toward it. 
one thing you can look at as an example is when you buy some food, the items that you get um, at Walmart, such as a drink, potato chips, or you might get a particular pasta sauce or like ragu, you probably didn't even form your attitudes toward those different brands by carefully evaluating the ingredients. You might have just you know, looked at the colorful packaging or you saw the commercial that made your mouth water. Um, you may have saw it, seen one of your friends use it at, um, when they were cooking at home. Central route of persuasion would require investing enough time and enough effort to be able to evaluate the evidence as well as reasoning logically about a decision. Your emotions can still enter into the decision process, but only if it's relevant. So think of it like this. If you're buying a new home, for example, you carefully will look and evaluate the quality of the house. You'll check out the price. You want to know about the neighborhood. You're going to you're going to dig and, and, and find a great deal more. You might be a, in a better mood when you see one house than another just because of the nicer weather. Yes, weather can have something to do with how you make decisions or some other irrelevant factor. But you don't let that kind of emotion influence your decision for the most part. So there are special techniques when we're talking about persuasion. People are more successful at persuading you if you like them or you see them as similar to being like you. Okay. So a powerful influence technique would be to show that many other people are doing what you want them to do. Civilization has been based on a concept of reciprocation. If you do me a favor, then I owe you one. An offer usually can be seen to be good or bad depending on how it's compared to something else. So we look at liking and similarities and that's someone you like or consider similar to you which is going to make you persuade you a little more so if you do like them because of those similarities. We do take a look at new social norms. When, when the majority of people are in favor of a particular idea or a behavior and it looks appealing, we utilize reciprocation, that feeling of obligations to be able to, you know, pay back the favor. Um, or get a favor for doing something for somebody else. And then of course, the contrast and effects, it might appear more desirable because it's kind of different from what you're accustomed to. So now, other techniques, when we look at in the foot in the door, bait and switch, and that's not all techniques. Here we're looking at first, the request makes you look like likely to accept a second request. There have been attempts at persuading by using threats, those fear messages, which can be sometimes effective, but generally not always. If a message is too frightening, people are simply just not going to want to listen to it. They're going to want to run. Or if they do listen to it, they're not going to really believe that it'll happen. An extreme message may suggest that the problem is hopeless. Okay, so remember foot in the door techniques usually is implicit compliance, whereas someone might start with a little request and then build up. Once you accept that small request, they're going to build up to a larger one. The bait and switch technique is getting you to comply by first offering you that can't be real type of deal. It allows the other person to commit to that deal and then it'll make more demands after that. That's not all technique. Now understand that these are things you might have heard sales pitches and commercials and on infomercials. You will see the foot in the door technique. You're going to see the bait and switch technique. That's not all technique. Saying, well, you know, if you buy that pan today, not only will you get the pan, but you're going to get all the utensils to go with it. That's not all. And then, of course, the fear messages. Well, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to make sure you don't pass this course. Now, isn't that something horrible, which you know I would never do, but 
That's a fair message. All right, looking at delayed influences. Suppose you hear an idea from somebody with poor qualifications. They're really not competent in a particular area that's being discussed. Because of what you think of that person, that speaker, you'll reject that idea. Then later on, and it could be a month later or so, you'll forget where you heard the idea. And this is kind of like having amnesia, source amnesia. And then you only remember the idea itself. So at that point, its persuasive impact will increase. Psychologists, we use this term sleeper effect to describe delayed persuasion by initially rejected message. So someone might say, well, you know, <clears throat> You should try listening to music when you study. You'd be like, oh, no, nah, that ain't going to work. That's not going to work. But yet down the line in the middle of the semester, you know, everybody's talking about, hey, we got to come up with a way to study some more and be able to lock this information in. And all of a sudden, this theory about music and how you can associate it with the work because you'll be listening to your favorite music which would help to help you keep the information and retain that information in all of a sudden it became your idea rather than the person who told you about it about a month ago minority influences is having very little effect um through persistent repetition if those messages would actually the slowly will be adopted because the majority thinks it's something that is more impactful. All right, let's talk about those differences in resistance to being persuaded, okay? So if people have been warned that someone will try to persuade you of something, or if you've um, previously heard a weak version of this persuasive argument, you tend not to want to deal with it. You tend to resist it. These two different areas, forewarning effect and inoculation effect. When we're talking about forewarning effect, yes, it's a phenomenon of situation in which informing a person they're about to hear a persuasive speech is automatically going to get you jumping into your defense mode and resist. And that's going to weaken the persuasion of it. The inoculation effect is where it's a tendency where we would be less persuaded by an argument because we heard a weaker one first. Go figure. All right. Techniques that's designed to pressure a suspect into confessing decreases the reliability of the confession. And that's going to be because under the circumstances, most people who are innocent will also confess. Um, we've seen too many different stories and heard too many different situations in which people were uh, railroaded into prison over a confession. But a lot of times people forget the interrogation process was quite coercive. Well, if you give us this information, then we can make sure that your sentence will be lighter. Look, you're not going to get away with this, but we can help you if you tell us this information. Even if you didn't do the crime, they keep drilling it into you. And when you add that with the nourishment of sleep deprivation, as well as other coercive techniques, a person, even when they're innocent, just to be over of the situation, will finally confess to a crime that they didn't even commit. Now let's look at some interpersonal attractions. This is module 13.4. In this module, we'll be looking theoretically at people, how people and other animals looks at uh, physical attractiveness when they're thinking about the hookup <laughs> or connecting with another person. We're gonna look at factors that would increase the probability of when you form, of how you formulate uh, romantic or platonic friendships. Uh, and we'll look at differences between passionate and companion love.
when we're talking about how we connect with others in developing a relationship, we have to look at proximity and familiarity. Proximity means closeness. We're more likely to become friends with a person who lives or works in proximity to us. Uh, a reason being, it's going to be important to understand that people who live nearby will discover that they have more things in common with one another. Another reason we can look at is just you have more exposure, that exposure effect. And then in this principle, it's that more often we come in contact with someone or something, the more likely we will start to like that person or that particular object. However, you need to know that with familiarity, <laughs> it generally does not always increase one's liking. Becoming familiar with a person will give you an opportunity to be able to find out what you might have in common with them, but it's also going to let you see the flaws. And you may decide, mm, no, can't do. Good example I can share with you is I have a good friend. I mean, good friend that helped me through thick and thin. And although we have a lot of things that's in common with one another. The closer proximity I had to that person, the more I also saw their flaws. And although if they needed help, I would be there for them in a hot minute. Social reasons, there's a whole lot of social distance between me and that individual because some of their attributes um, I don't like, I don't care for. So rather than be around it and create cognitive dissonance, I keep myself clear, okay? So that's something that we have to consider in terms of proximity and familiarity. Uh, when we're talking about physical attractiveness or if we look at different birds, for example, Females prefer colorful males than singing loudly and having these long tails. And only a healthy male can probably afford those traits of growing bright feathers and long traits. Throughout evolution, most females have been able to choose such partners based on healthier offspring than those who are dull colored, quiet, inactive males. Now, us humans, on the other hand, Good looking generally would be normal. An attractive person with nearly average features and few ir irregularities. You know, their teeth will be straight, there's no acne or any type of asymmetric, like their nose being crooked or something on that nature. Um, or if we talked about females, they, you know, they wouldn't have any facial hair, their skin would be nice and smooth. Normal basically is implying that you're healthy. Good appearances is evidently going to be a reason for someone, you know, to show someone's health. If, uh, for example, you see dark, dark circles, sometimes I have really dark circles, you can kind of know and imagine that I might not have gotten much sleep or I haven't had enough intake of water. So we look toward those cues to kind of set the tone and allow us to understand a person. Physical attractiveness is that cue to let us know if you're healthy or is you, are you going to be someone I want to get a hookup with. It's those approximate features that we use to allow us to know whether we really truly like a person. So most romantic partners, as well as close friends, they're going to resemble each other in particular ways. That being their age, physical attractiveness, their political beliefs, as well as religious beliefs, their level of intelligence, as well as education, and their attitudes. And as the relationship grows, the interests will become more and more alike for the person. According to the change or equity theories, social relationships are basically transactions in which partners will exchange goods and services. 
if you think about in business uh, areas, a relationship is going to be more stable if both partners believe that the deal or their task is fair. It's going to be easier to establish a fair deal if the partners are equally attractive, equally intelligent, and contribute equally to the um, finances as well as tasks and so on. With technology today, the internet has added a new dimension to dating. Wow, big dimension. And if any of y'all ever watched 911, this week they had an episode in terms of internet dating that might scare a person. But internet dating services pretty much will introduce people who never had met otherwise. And it brings couples together who at least for a few important aspects have some commonalities. But be careful with that, okay? Because sometimes self-report is not always accurate. People sometimes make changes and do things in order to benefit them. All right, let's talk about commitments. Give me one moment. I had to take, take a break real fast. In the blink of an eye, I'm back. <laughs> anyway. When we're talking about marriage as well as long-term commitments, studies have shown and demonstrated couples whose arguments escalate to greater and greater anger are likely to consider divorce later. The best predictor of a long-term satisfaction is, much, is usually displayed of genuine affection between those who are newlyweds. Psychologists have been able to distinguish between passionate love and compassionate love. In terms of passionate love, this is marked by sexual desire as well as excitement, whereas companionate love is going to be marked more with wanting to share and care for the person as well as be protective for them. Love generally will fade for many couples, but for some it will remain just as strong throughout the lifetime. Now let's move to 13.5. We're still discussing interpersonal influences. Here we're going to be looking at Ash's classic experiment on conformity. We're going to look at the cultural differences in conformity. This is a good one. Evaluating Zimbardo's prison experiment. We'll look at Milgram's study on obedience. And then we're going to talk about group polarization as well as group think. All right. Social influences. People usually are influenced constantly. First and foremost, people will set norms that's going to define their expectations to different experiences. You might watch how others dress and then act in a particular situation, or you might tend to do the same thing as they do. Another uh, thing is, is that they may provide us with uh, information. So one way we can look at it is if you approach a building and you find that a crowd quickly flees from it, screaming, hmm, they're probably letting you know, don't do it, don't go. And then finally, uh, or the third reasoning behind this would be people influence us just by suggesting a possible uh, action. So when you're seeing people yawn, you ever find yourself yawning with them? Why do you think that is? They didn't give you any new information and you don't necessarily wish to resemble them in this instance. However, you find yourself copying it because seeing a yawn suggested the possibility. Now, conformity. Conformity means when we're altering our behavior to match other people's behaviors or their expectations. To find out whether or not we're willing to be conformists or our opinions, um, we try to relate it to the same as others. Even if we know that it's wrong, we have to take a look at Solomon Ashes. Uh, study in which he conducted a now 
famous experiment. In his conformity studies, a participant was asked which of the three lines matched another line. And before answering the question, the participant heard other people. And we, we can call these other people confederates to answer it incorrectly. Surprisingly enough, 37 of the 50 participants conformed to the majority at least one time. And then there was 14 conformed on most of the different trials they had there. So when Ash looked at the variances of the number of confederates who gave incorrect answers, he saw that people conformed to a group of three or four just as readily as to a larger group. One thing though, however, a participant with an ally giving correct answers conformed much less. So are people in certain cultures gonna be more prone to conformity as a general rule? Well, when we look at, for example, Asian countries, the percentages of conforming answers tend to be more higher than those in the United States. Cultures of Southern Asia like China, as well as Japan, are often described as a collectivistic uh, population, whereas in the United States, we're considered individualistic. We have individualistic cultures. So according to these viewpoints, with the Western culture, it encourages being individual, being original, and being unique. Whereas in the Eastern cultures, they're looking more for subordination of a person uh, to the welfare of their family or to their society. Researchers demonstrated and suggest that the collectivistic no notion is gonna be wrong. Other points of view though, each country has multiple subcultures. So ultimately speaking, we're not again, going to be all the same and we're going to have our own different value systems and belief systems but just remember that with western cultures it's considered individualistic and with eastern cultures it's considered more collectivistic okay now how obedient are we when it comes to powers of authority i'm not i could just share that however Looking at how we studied obedience, in the early 70s, Philip Zimbardo, who was a psychologist, uh, he and his colleagues, they performed one of our well-known studies in terms of social psychology. Pretty much what they did was they took some college students and paid them to play roles of guards and prisoners for a two-week period during their vacation, during spring break, like for example. So what they did was the researchers set up the, uh, a basement of a Stan in Stanford University building and made it look like a prison. And then what they did was they randomly assigned participants to the roles of either a guard or a prisoner. In six days, they had to stop the study because many of the guards started physically and emotionally bullying the prisoners. Now, Zimbardo, he took from this that the situation had elicited cruel behavior. And these normal, well-educated, middle-class young men, when given the power over others, quick, fast, and a hurry started abusing that power. What this implied is, is that we really shouldn't blame people who abuse their power because most of us would probably do the same thing in that situation. Now, another study <clears throat> that was conducted was by Stanley Milgram. And pretty much what he hypothesized was that when an authority figure gives you normal people instructions to do something that might hurt another person, that some of them will obey those instructions. So he t tested his hypothesis by doing this experiment that's also very popular and well known called the Milgram experiment. In this experiment, two adult males <clears throat> um, at a time, they arrived at the experiment. There was a real participant and then there was a confederate um, of the experiment pretending to be a participant. 
the experimenter told them that this study is about learning and that one person would be the teacher and the other would be the learner. So the teacher would read list of words through a microphone to the, to the learner um, who's sitting in a different room. The teacher then would <clears throat> test the learner's memory for the words. Now, whenever the learner made a mistake, the teacher was to deliver an electric shock as punishment. However, understand, the learner never really got shocked, but the teacher didn't know that. The teacher was led to believe that they were getting shocked each time they gave an incorrect answer. Throughout the experiment, the learner made a lot of mistakes and the experiment, what they did was they had the person who played the teacher to begin punishing the learner with 15 volts for the first mistake and then they would have to increase by an additional 15 volts for each successive mistake up to a maximum of 450 volts, okay? As the voltage went up, the learner in the next room would cry and scream out in pain. And the participant who was the teacher would ask who would take responsibility for any harm that's coming to that learner. And when the experimenter replied that they would, the experimenter would take responsibility. They insisted while the shock may be painful, they're not dangerous. So when the shocks reached 150 volts, the learner part, the person in the confederate, begged the teacher, begged to get out of the experiment, complaining that their heart um, was bothering them. And beginning at 270 volts, that learner started screaming in agony. And when it reached 300 volts, started shouting and screaming, he would no longer answer any questions. At 330 volts, he made no response at all. Yet the experimenter ordered the teacher to continue asking questions and deliver those shots. Now remember, the learner was not really being shocked, but the screams came from a recording. Of 40 participants, 25 of those participants who would play the role of teacher delivered shots all the way to 450 volts. So, why did so many people obey orders? One reason would be that the experimenter agreed to take the responsibility for their actions. Another reason is that the teacher identified with the experimenter and saw themselves as his assistant. So, the experimenter started with a small request which was again 15 um, volts and gradually progressed it to those stronger shocks. So it's kind of easy to agree to the small request and then that continual agreeing um, kind of made it easier to agree for the next one and the one after that. If you already delivered many shocks, you're unlikely to stop or quit because if you quit, you take responsibility for your actions. And we know we're going to do the active observer effect and talked about that, but we're going to lay it on that uh, experiment because he said he would be responsible for what's happening to the learner. All right, so when we're talking about group decision making, group decisions are usually going to be better when there's an individual decisions. <clears throat> but the outcome will depend really on the circumstance. So if you and someone are equally well informed, you probably will make a better decision together than either of you making a decision separately. However, there will be some group work that works together better than other groups. There's been one study that did a comparison about how groups um, made decisions about moral uh, judgments, visual problems, ways of um, dividing limited types of resources, and so on. In that particular study, decisions were best in groups that cooperated with each other, letting everyone participate about it equally rather than having one person dominate the group. Groups that had high percentages of women, excuse me, usually outperformed groups that were mostly of men who tend to get uh, more competitive and argued. 
And when we're talking about groups of people, we have to look at how they would lean mostly in the same direction on a given issue, which often makes it more extreme decisions than most people would have made on their own. Now, that particular uh, phenomenon is what we call group polarization. When we're talking about group think, group think happens when members of a cohesive group fails to express their opposition to a decision, um, a fear of making waves or a bad impression, or you know, they feel that they might harm the cohesiveness of, of the group. And the main elements that would lead to groupthink are going to be overconfidence through leadership, underestimation of those problems, and then having a pressure to conform to what everybody else is thinking. On that note, we have just finished chapter 13, okay? Please be sure to follow the assignments that will be uh, beneath this video in the link. And of course, this will be due on Friday, the assignments uh, at 11.59 p.m. As always, if there's any questions or concerns, please feel free to drop me a note in the inbox I will be checking and will answer within a 24-hour period. Have a great day. Have a great week. Stay safe.